Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, those new panelists who have just joined us. Uh, Kevin Ashley is uh, director of uh, Digital Curation Center, and uh, he is uh, an excellent capacity and uh, capability among research communities uh, in matter of digital curation. And previously, he was uh, head of uh, digital. University of London Computer Center and was also involved uh, in the uh, National Digital Archive on Datasets. Uh, Ruta Petronskaiter uh, is a professor of uh, linguistics uh, at the Department of uh, Lithuanian Languages uh, without us Magnus University and she's also a vice chair of uh, Research Council of Lithuania uh, she chairs the uh, com Committee on Social Science and Humanities. So Ruta will be wearing two hats, a researcher hat and uh, a funder hat. Uh, and uh, uh, you already know Lars, so I won't be introducing him. Uh, and uh, last but not least uh, uh, is uh, Damien uh, Le Carpentier, and he's a uh, project director of Research Infrastructure Unit at uh, CSS uh, in Finland, and he's also a project manager of EU DOT. And uh, if you don't mind, we'll start with some questions to the panel, which I'll ask, and then there will be an opportunity for you to ask uh, the questions, sir, and we continue with this topic of infrastructures and sustainability. And my first question is perhaps to Ruta and Kevin. Uh, so perhaps to Ruta, as a researcher, how do you as a researcher benefit from uh, infrastructures uh, which are already openly available? And what's your experience with them? So perhaps I don't know if you could start. And please use the mic. Uh, just, I think it should be going. Um, hello to everybody. Uh, well, the question is self-obvious. We benefit in a number of um, uh, ways, uh, uh, first of all, uh, 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 as data users and then as data providers. Um, as uh, data users, we are very happy to have an access to uh, a wealth of publications that ha uh, would have not been accessible otherwise, uh, still having quite limited library funds. Uh, as uh, data providers, uh, we could add with our own publications, especially from uh, journals that opened uh, up recently and were submitted to DOAJ. Uh, uh, and uh, I hear it from my colleague researchers uh, with joyful exclamations uh, that uh, they are uh, papers published some time ago have been kind of uh, recycled. They were published elsewhere recently uh, with a very good impact and new possibilities to start a, a scientific dialogue. And if I could add it from the funder's perspective, um, well, uh, that's also very fascinating because we uh, have a possibility to disseminate uh, the results or um, nationally funded projects uh, on national open access repository and also internationally. Uh, and what I'm uh, extremely keen of is the possibility to get some feedback for the evaluation uh, for further funding activities, uh, meaning evaluation that uh, uh, based on research community comments uh, for the open access papers. Thanks a lot. Uh, perhaps can we continue? Yeah. So my reflections on, on the benefits are really, I guess, really from my perspective as a citizen rather than uh, given that I'm not a funder, I'm not a publisher, I'm not and of the other actors you, you, you mentioned in, in, in this area. And, and, and I'm thinking particularly partly because my organization care is mainly about the management uh, of research data. Uh, and the answer to the question is going to really be thinking about open access uh, to, to data infrastructures. Uh, there's no question that I know one reason uh, I benefit as a citizen is that the, the money, and it's mainly public money that's spent on research, uh, is shown to be far more effectively spent 
uh, if we ensure that the <coughs> knowledge about, even if data itself can't be open, the existence of data, the metadata record about the data can be public knowledge. Uh, and where it's, that's made available and where it's tied to publications about the data, we have lots of evidence that this reduces the incidence of research fraud. That's good for all of us. In particular case, you know, it's good if you or I need a, a, a medical procedure that depends on the results of research. Uh, I'm, I'm more comforted if I know it's less likely uh, that there's some fraud behind the, the, the treatment uh, I'm, I'm receiving. Um, but I also know that, that research is likely to happen more quickly, and that's also a more effective use of public funds if we make data openly available. Uh, and for individual researchers and for the university that I work in, um, we know also that our research is more likely to be more highly cited if we can make our data available and if we can link it to the publications. Uh, and in some cases also one has to, I've, in the past when I did carry out research, you don't always get a publication out of a research project. Sometimes you collect a lot of data and you don't find what you hope to find and you don't end up with something that's usable for you. But it's quite possible that the data you collected does tell somebody else something interesting, that there's a story in the data that, that you can't find as an individual, but somebody else can. And if there's infrastructure to make that data available, even though you didn't publish anything, somebody else might do so. Uh, and, and that's good for one's own reputation, and it's good for society as a whole if we can do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Karen. Perhaps you can keep the mic, uh, because my, my next question would also be perhaps to you and to Ruta. Uh, so talked about those benefits, sir, and how do they relate to potential funding sources, sir? Okay, I, I can speak in particular then about experience in the UK where there's been a lot of debate uh, at, at the moment about um, who is going to pay for keeping this data available. Most of the research funders now have requirements that are, that are tied to grant funding that says you need to, to make the data available uh, for some period of time, a minimum of often of 10 years. Not just 10 years after the research is done, but 10 years after the last time the data was used. Which of course, if it's, if it's good data and has much reuse potential, that could, that could be many, many more than, 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 than 10 years on. But from what we can see at the moment, there's not, it's not really that there's a lack of money to pay for this. The money is there in the system one way or another. And also the, the evidence we have, for instance, on the value of existing research data centers, things like the social science data archives, uh, the archaeology data service in the UK, shows that the, we get much more value out of those data centers in terms of more efficient research than the money we put into them. So this helps convince funders that this is money well spent, although there's, there's always an argument that, that if you spend um, 100,000 pounds or euros on keeping a data center going, that's money that you could have spent on research, but you didn't. Um, and, and it's important for us to get that evidence that says, no, actually, in the end, that does make more money available for research because the research becomes more efficient. It only seems to be taking money away from, from the research uh, budget. But certainly, the, the, there are arguments also about that, that it's important for universities to use the money that they get out of the, the, the overheads from research grants, and although the details of this are different in every country, there's always some uh, system like this where there's money that doesn't just pay your direct cost but pays for some uh, elements of, of keeping the university running. Uh, universities initially see, again, that this obligation to keep data as, uh, as an additional cost. Uh, the more they realize about how it increases the citation rates of their research, how it makes their, their own research more uh, effective, they begin to see this not as a cost, but as an investment. Uh, and again, that they will get the return back from, from, from that funding. So it's, it was a worry and it was a problem for many people, but I think it's rapidly moving away from that. Well, what, what could I add from, the, from a funder's perspective? Um, actually, we have very favorable laws for open access for both data uh, collected during the project period and for publications. Well, uh, f publications are easier to deal with. We have where to put them openly. Uh, they're both on institutional and uh, supra-institutional level. Uh, but data is our uh, headache. Uh, at, at the moment, we are uh, in 
means some kind of a crossroad. We have to work out our open access data uh, policy uh, to be conscientious and to stick to our own requirement to have the data open. Uh, so we have a few possibilities uh, and we try to follow the first one. Uh, well, to uh, include uh, our data and to participate in S3 uh, ERIC projects like CLARIN, European Social Survey, CESDA. Uh, well, we have a roadmap for that and uh, our research council has a special commission uh, for the expertise of uh, national partners um, uh, willing to join the infrastructures. Uh, uh, but okay, it's, it's, it's good for social sciences and humanities, but it's uh, um, subject limited, so to say. Not all the research data that were acquired during the project period could be fed into these big um, infrastructures uh, that also will um, check the data for quality and uh, in, uh, provide quality seals. So we have to have something of our own um, either on institutional level or on national level uh, to deal with the data. Uh, it's an, well, kind of a, an urgent need because we started uh, five, six years ago the competitive financing of research uh, that kind of uh, implied this openness of data. Uh, so now we have the first uh, results, the first data still uh, under the embargo period. Um, but, well, okay, we have to decide and, well, open air, uh, um, uh, well, strategies and seminars, they're very helpful for us to decide how to deal with it. Uh, uh, on a final note, I'd like to say that, well, okay, uh, it's a kind of um, generational gap with our researchers, younger researchers, they are willing to search for, well, existing data and to use it, uh, while uh, the um, uh, older generation, they preserve, uh, pre uh, prefer self or home-made data. And this is a, a, a big headache because they are so varied, so different, and so difficult to make, to, to, to make into something compatible. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our two other panelists, uh, Lars and Damien, uh, uh, the question I'd like uh, you to answer. We've heard a lot uh, earlier about uh, stakeholders, that we should be engaging with stakeholders. Uh, so my question is, uh, who are those stakeholders we should be engaging with? And we, I mean, uh, those who support uh, open access infrastructure, being that uh, publications and data. Uh, with whom should we collaborate and partner, uh, how we should uh, set up a governance and coordination system, uh, so perhaps if you could elaborate a bit about that. Yeah, uh, I could give a go on that. Uh, there's, uh, there's work going on in uh, knowledge exchange, which is a collaboration between national agencies in Finland, uh, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, the UK and uh, Germany, yeah. Uh, there's been uh, produced a number of reports. Uh, there'll be uh, there'll be a, a meeting in February where uh, potential funders will be invited to discuss uh, how to actually uh, establish uh, a, a coalition of shared services and funders to to uh, to to find a way forward for uh, establishing uh, this uh, open access infrastructure. And of course, there's a lot of uh, important services out there that are uh, uh, developing and, and operating in splendid isolation, but we want a more comprehensive uh, open access infrastructure to, uh, to develop. Uh, the the big challenge here is that uh, despite that uh, Science Europe and even the Global Research Council are talking about promoting open access and so forth, it's very difficult for them so far to realize that creating an open access infrastructure uh, 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 requires investments. And uh, this is really uh, uh, a big uh, task for us to make the case for that. Uh, it's kind of strange because if we look at uh, the current infrastructure for the 
predominant model for academic publishing. The research funders are already funding that. I mean, Thomson Reuters, subscription agents, what have you. Uh, it's funded indirectly uh, via the research funders. So now we, we should have to find a, a model where we can create a coalition and define, of course, which elements in an infrastructure would be necessary. So we have a huge uh, task there, but definitely uh, my target here is to bring the research funders to the table and make them realize that this, uh, despite their mandates and support for open access uh, repositories and journals, this will not in the long run work unless we have investments in the things that would make this uh, work together and, and be a comprehensive open access infrastructure. So it's the research funders that should come to the table and pay the bill. Thank you. So you're talking about research funders. I, I'd like to add um, researchers to the table as well. So uh, so I'm, I'm speaking here with my uh, UDAT hat on. So we're trying to develop a, a European data infrastructure uh, to take care of research data, but research data that is not really uh, ready for publication. So uh, very various uh, digital objects coming from uh, instruments, uh, sensors, uh, uh, high performance computing machines and so on. And uh, in this area, there is no uh, real business uh, model, no uh, best practice for uh, sharing data, there is no uh, citation uh, mechanisms, uh, no credit mechanisms to uh, credit you for uh, sharing the data. So I think all is to be uh, to be set up. But what is clear when you talk to the, the, the researchers and research communities uh, that we are working uh, with is that uh, they want that this data is uh, reusable immediately. So then they're not so much interested with archiving this data or preserving this data, but they are really uh, interested in uh, having this data immediately available uh, for their research purposes. So that means that um, if you want to have this the services uh, sustainable and useful, then you have to take into consideration how uh, this data fits in the researchers' uh, scientific workflows. And, uh, and this, I'm not sure that uh, the funders uh, are the right uh, people to to make this recommendation and to provide this um, this knowledge. And I guess the the research communities themselves and the, uh, and the researchers are are, are probably uh, have a stake here in uh, in uh, in trying to uh, define and provide the requirements for uh, for open uh, for open access. Something on, on this question or uh, not? Very briefly, because I think others have, have said it, and certainly I, I agree with Damien's point that the researchers themselves are, are key stakeholders here, and, and, and finding either ways to communicate the benefits to them of, of, of using uh, infrastructure, or ways to to put tools, as you say, that, that fit into their workflow rather than require them to change is, is, is really important. I think there are a couple of um, obvious examples um, from, from other projects elsewhere that, that illustrate this. So one uh, from a project called Data One uh, in the US, some of you m may have heard of. Uh, it's a simple tool called Data Up. that's an add-on to Microsoft Excel. Uh, so a spreadsheet that's very, very commonly used. Spreadsheets are a really common tool in many areas of research for collecting data. Uh, people who work professionally with data tend to look down on spreadsheets. You know, they're not proper databases, they're not proper ways to manage information, but the reality is that that's what they use. So the folks in Data One said, okay, let's not tell scientists don't use spreadsheets. Let's give them something that makes them produce better data using the spreadsheet. So it just encourages them to supply a little bit of extra metadata, to supply column headings that, that make more sense. And instantly, they don't really have to change what they do or the tools they're using, but they're producing better data and more reusable data as a result. And, and more tools like that, I think, are, are, are absolutely um, key. And I chair also, I think, your reflection about that difference. Um, it's not, I think, always between generations of researchers, but that's a common split uh, that we see for some research. And, a, and another tool there that I think illustrates that is, uh, is Figshare. So that's... Uh, a, a simple tool that makes it straightforward to, to share 
um, the, the the information behind figures. It's a, a commercial service, although it's free to use if you make your data open. Uh, and, and that's got really high take up amongst PhD students and early career uh, researchers as a free way of making data open. I think it's interesting to reflect there that's backed by if effectively by Nature Publishing through a company called Digital Science. Uh, and they must believe that there's money to be made there somehow or other. Uh, I think it's an open question yet how they're going to make that money. But uh, it's a worry, I think, for us as funders or as universities about how easily perhaps an entire generation of data producers are going to move towards commercial platforms like that and that perhaps we're going to lose control of, of uh, what is really a public good. Would only be fair if we take a question or two from the audience. Uh, do we have any questions you would like to ask now? I hope you are awake and everything. <laughs> then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to my list of questions and please uh, think about yours. Uh, uh, here we're talking about sustainability. Uh, Perhaps once, once again we can uh, address this issue, uh, how can we really make those open access infrastructure sustainable right now, not, I don't know, well, also in, in 10 years time, uh, but what, what, what should be our immediate steps, sir, and uh, perhaps some projections for the future. Uh, and it, it's, it's been already mentioned here is that uh, some kind of collective action is needed because if uh, like every individual infrastructure will be trying to sustain itself by itself, it probably won't work. So perhaps if you could elaborate, I don't know, maybe the start with Lars and Damien, uh, Kevin, I don't know if Uta would like to add something. Uh. Mm -hmm. uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um. I think it's important that uh, that that we bring uh, the major open access service providers to the same table uh, with uh, the uh, the potential funders and, and try to define what what are the bits and pieces that are needed for a, a future open access uh, infrastructure and try to uh, sort out sort out how. How should this be governed? How should this be funded? Uh, uh, but this will, of course, not happen uh, tomorrow. And it, it, of course, it is a uh, it's it's quite quite a challenge to to sort of to create such an infrastructure by committee, so to speak, because the existing infrastructure for the traditional publishing has not been created that way. That, that, has, uh, that has grown out uh, organically and, and, and based on sort of commercial uh, uh, incentives. So, uh, so we have to try to, uh, to find another way uh, of doing that. On the, on the one hand, provide uh, this platform for, uh, for open access, uh, basically for free, and on the other hand, to try to uh, sustain it by uh, developing a business model that uh, that generates uh, income or, or revenue in, in some sense. I, I don't have any specific uh, answers, but uh, but we have to pursue that uh, that road. Um, I think there is another issue uh, the, uh, that could be um, uh, raised by funders if we uh, include uh, uh, the topic of data. Uh, and reliable resources of data into the evaluation model of project proposals that could could be helpful i believe just because reliable resources they help to generate reliable research uh, that is fundable in general that's part of methodology and uh, well i think it, it it has to be included uh, in the in, in the uh, legal pattern in the evaluation pattern we simply have to talk about it as uh, an, an important issue uh, but well okay what what can we called as reliable resources from my own perspective i know that uh, 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 usually, the most sustainable uh, open access data resources, they are based either on personal initiative, they are cheap, but people are keen on, 
on 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 the idea and they uh, uh, well uh, they spend their time on it uh, and then these mega uh, huge uh, resources uh, something on on the national level uh, well is is not always sustainable we can uh, see many ghosts on internet uh, of well something like data from previous projects that are not sustainable anymore and you you see and become sad immediately uh, so I think if we talk more about it as some kind of basis uh, for the project to be funded it could help finally um, but again just to, to add some reflections some thoughts about infrastructure I think uh, first I'd echo that point made by by router that that sometimes Small-scale initiatives are the ones that, that are going to, to deliver us the right sort of infrastructure. Although I think that there are certainly cases for the sorts of things you described, Lars, where collectively we only need one of something, and, we, and for for Europe or for the world, and it's important then to to get agreement amongst all the stakeholders about how we do that one thing, rather than trying to produce um, many of them. Uh, th there are other things where if we if we try to begin by building a huge infrastructure, we're almost doomed uh, to fail. And I'm, I'm struck, for instance, by, uh, again, thinking about two things. What's happened in the UK with, with infrastructure in, in universities on which we can build a national layer has mainly been driven by, by competition. And I say this as somebody who's, whose politics are socialist, but, but I recognize that sometimes competition produces the right results. Edinburgh does something not because of a national initiative to do something uh, or, or, or because it persuades itself, because it's frightened that Oxford is going to do it more quickly. That's what drove our university to do something. And there are so many other cases like that where, I mean, you can see it, as, uh, but if you, if you have a few leaders and you have good examples for them, it encourages others to follow and, and, and infrastructure can emerge uh, in that way by, by lots of small initiatives. And, and the other, um, thing I'm struck by is that a parallel European project, which some of you may have heard of, called sim for rdm which is trying to look at how to get the right infrastructure for research data management to emerge in Europe. And one of its starting uh, principles is that we have cultural and political differences across Europe that, that, that mean that it's very unlikely that one solution will work everywhere, and that it's important to recognize the different starting positions, the different cultural attitudes, and the different political situations to, to have a to find a way in which you get interoperable infrastructure where, where you, the means to the ends are different uh, in different nation states um, and and that that same is true in different research disciplines or in different universities where you need to use different mechanisms to get to the same end yeah thank you um yeah, so, so perhaps we should uh, look for a more uh, dynamic and flexible uh, model where different components mix in the end uh, the infrastructure. Uh, I was also wondering, I mean, we we all trap with this uh, sustainability uh, debate and, and maybe we're thinking in the too long term and we are uh, trapped by previous models where, uh, you know, we wanted to set up something for forever. Uh, and and I'm not sure uh, that is the right uh, paradigm at the moment with researchers and research that that changes constantly and the instruments and things. So perhaps we should define what we think as a as a reasonable uh, sustainability. Perhaps it's not 20 years, but perhaps it's uh, it's uh, three years, five years, and uh, after that we see because uh, after that. Uh, the, the people and research practices will have changed, so uh, there's no point on investing on a on a very big uh, static infrastructure for 20 years if after five years it becomes uh, obsolete. Uh, in ministries, governments, there's no one really uh, who can who can put money on on the table for more than five years. Of, of obviously, it depends on on the countries, but it's it's harder and harder to get any commitment more than more than five years. So, so perhaps we should have uh, a, a bit more trust into uh, the people who are who are building the tools, building the infrastructures, and have some have some clear milestones, and 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 not looking always after after a model that that might not be uh, viable after all. Yeah. 
uh, a question from the audience because we'll be wrapping up uh, our discussion. Uh, any burning questions? Uh, yeah, I guess and we can uh, thank our panelists uh, and we'll be moving on with wrapping up uh, the meeting. So Mikael will take a floor to wrap up and let's thank our panelists.